enjoy it. That's the hair you wear the other day, right? That's right, the hat I was wearing the other day. Yep, yep. <laughs> Bless you. I was out of the bar. <laughs> what? No way. I went to a bar this weekend for, um, and it happened to coincide with the um, the Duke and the, the Wisconsin game, and so I put that hat on, and I made so many friends. <gasps> are you from Wisconsin? No. Did you go to school there? No. Why are you wearing that hat? I have their hat. So. I have this thing, uh, it's sort of silly, since I never, I almost dropped out of high school and no college would admit me, with the exception of Mississippi State. I can give you Mississippi State. Um, uh, everywhere I go to give a talk, not necessarily invited, but if a conference is there that's on a college campus, I have to get like a piece of that, like a memorabilia of that campus. It's like, it reminds me that I'm lucky to be in a spot where I can work on a university, work at a university and whatnot. And Wisconsin is a gorgeous campus. Absolutely. Did you go to Wisconsin? Or? You did. Okay. Absolutely love it. And, and State Street was sane. I mean, great atmosphere, but no riots. <laughs> no couches were burnt, I don't believe. So <laughs> love Wisconsin. Uh, love the lake, the lakes. It's, it's just an awesome place to go. So. I mean, I mean, not not that KU isn't pretty awesome too. <laughs> so, what were we talking about? Structural equation modeling. Let's put it all together. Believe it or not, structural equation modeling. As we're talking about sports here to start the class, you're kind of like, oh, it's kind of an afterthought. This this lecture is sort of like an afterthought. You know everything there is to know about how to do this lecture ahead of time. Right? The path analysis part. The measurement model part, the factor analysis part. If you put both of those together, you treat your factors just like they're now variables that you've observed, you've got a structural equation model. Now, th that's the nuts and bolts of it. All the Levon syntax is the same. How you check model fit is the same. How you modify models are the same. Everything, all of it, all the same. Eh. Want to go home now? Now you made the effort to be here. Let me. I made the. I actually made new slides for this week, so I was not pleased with how I taught this the last time. So uh, you know, I'm finding ways to make make things work. So in in path and the, the structural equation model, and we're going to put it together. I'm going to talk a little bit about the, the the sequence to it, and I'm going to give you another example of how to use SEM. Uh, so there's two examples in here really, but really the idea is we want to do multiple things where we have. Uh, multiple equations, like path analysis, but some of those variables are latent. Sound good? Okay. Anyone think they would have a shot of how to do this if I just told you that from the get-go this is how it was? Remember the path analysis syntax? It was tilde, all right? This is dv over here and iv is over here. And what was the factor analysis syntax? equals tilde. And this was factor over here. And this was uh, indicators over here or variables. Over here, right? If you want to combine both of these, you create a factor. And then the factor either goes up into the dv or one, is one of the ivs. And if you have 10 factors, you put them all in there as well. Two factors, one factor, no factors, whatever. That's it. You already have the syntax. Model fit, already the same. You are probably going to be able to predict what I'm going to say in all these slides. So let's do the underlying theory to begin with. Uh, that doesn't mean that you can't ask me questions uh, and, uh, and, and help me fill in where you may be missing things. The other thing that, um, so as this, is, this slide is exactly that. It's, uh, I'm, I'm using the word SEM to refer to path analyses with latent variables. Uh, in general, in this context, it, it goes on to assume most often it's used with multivariate normal error terms with multivariate normal factors. Right. Add those together. Uh, that's what we've done in class this whole year. The word SEM, I know a couple of your projects, they said, I'm not sure I can do this in SEM. Like, the word SEM is kind of a throwaway. What is SEM? Where is it, you know, if you ask the SEM world what it is, how many of you are going to AERA? Several of you. There's an SEM SIG SIG. I don't know if you've been to AERA before, but they have these things called are they called study interest groups or? Uh, they're like groups of people that aren't a full division, but like 
they pay AERA a little extra cash just to like get spam emails sent to them. And one of them is about structural equation modeling. Anyway, they 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 have talks on structural equation modeling, and they have a they even have a party, they have a social. Um, I can't remember. I think you go if you if you're part of the SIG, you get free drinks or at least a, a drink or two for free. So, by the way, for those of you going to AERA, I'll tell you what I told my advisees that I learned from my advisor. Which is the talks are pretty much garbage, but where the, the conference is, what you're supposed to do is network. So be prepared for networking opportunities, which means go out and drink. <laughs> you should see the way money is spent at these things. It's crazy. Um, anyway, SEM, path analysis, latent variables. A structural equation model, therefore, has two parts. There's the measurement model, which is the factor analysis, the latent terms. And then there's the path analysis between the latent and observed variables. And when we got to uh, factor analysis, we last week we did factor analysis with multiple factors, but we always start in the same place. Measure one thing, break it down to the one thing you're measuring. So measurement model for each factor, because that cuts down on the, the mess of um, where misfit might occur. And, and that's true. And actually, I'm going to reiterate on that. It, Measuring one thing well is important, so anytime you can simplify it to make sure you're measuring one thing well, please do so. But when you be expand beyond that um, and you add the factors together, just like last week's class we saw, when we added all four factors together, the fit was like one of the worst that we'd seen, right? It was, we took these four perfectly, almost perfectly fitting factor analyses, single factor models, put them into a joint model, and it went, to, it went crazy, right? Uh, in SEM, the same thing happens. Right? You usually start with your measurement models, make sure they're fine, and then you build your, your full path model with the measurement models involved in it. And that's where um, the practice or the art of SEM comes into play. I say art and then we start thinking, I'm start thinking like data massaging or data, have you heard the term data wrangling? No? That's an actual term. Let me see if I can find it. I'm going to have to go to Google just because I'm in the, in the mood to have Google around here. Uh, OK, Google. OK, Google. Define data wrangling. <laughs> it's not actually saying out loud for whatever reason, but it's a person in the, is the person performing the wrangling, that's a data wrangler, but it's an actual term. Uh, data munging, I didn't heard that before. Loosely, is loosely the process of manually converting or mapping data from raw form into another format. Data visualization, aggregation, training a statistical model. Sounds so, uh, right? Uh, yeah. Uh, it's the art of SEM. Anyway, the art is how do you take a model that fits poorly and where do you go to make it fit better? And what does that mean? So that's what we're going to talk about a little bit today. Ironically, um, this was an interesting course in my life. Uh, in learning this because, uh, again, I, I have this thing, I think I told you last night, last week, last night, last week, long night, um, I told you last week that um, I taught a test theory course here at KU a long time ago, and then shortly thereafter, she wasn't my wife, but my, my now wife, uh, she started the class up in Nebraska, and I loaned her my materials, and that helped her kind of put together her course. And then she, she's a fantastic teacher. If you ever have a chance to take a class from to do so, it's amazing. Um, so she made it way better. And then now I'm borrowing from her on some of her materials. And so we got to SEM. We're talking about this. She didn't teach an SEM course, but I was talking about this part. She's like, oh, build it this way and build up from measurement model and teach that. So I did that. And then I'm like, but what if it breaks? And she's like, yeah, nobody, nobody says it breaks. I'm like, no, it really it breaks all the time. When you go from measurement model to SEM, it breaks. It's something doesn't work. And it's the same thing that happened last week. If you read the books, they're like, build your measurement models, put them together into a multiple factor analysis, multiple, you know, multiple latent variable thing, and then, and, every, and you're fine. And the book example makes it sound good, and you can go and have popcorn and hang out downtown. And really what that, what you saw last week is it's never that easy or that clean. So I did some investigating in the books. Uh, and this 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 breaking part was novel to me. I didn't know you could break it so easily. And sure enough, things are somewhat fragile. So we're going to see that a little bit today. Uh, the complexity is a matter of, it, it's pretty straightforward in, in concept. It becomes a matter of, of issue when complexity built, raise its head when you have misfit and you have all sorts of it. So 
questions? Anything? Any anything you want to think about? No, the same with life. It seems so simple, and then no. I am sounding so philosophical. I don't mean to be. I'm a little loopy. I think that's the problem. So, path analysis. Remember that? How could you forget it? What's an endogenous variable? <laughs> Something, a variable whose variability is explained by one or more variables in the model. What's an exogenous variable? A variable that's not explained. Right? A predictor, usually. Path analyses are neat because predict, things that are in the model can predict other things in the model. All right, so that's where the math gets crazy. Here's an example from many slides ago, many classes ago with the math. By the way, this is where I'm going to say, yeah, these things should be circles. All right, these are latent variables. That should be a three latent variable measurement model. But the paper I was reading it from did not describe it as such. So this is an interplay between what is done commonly and what we teach here. So that's where next week's going to come in handy. What is it? What are they assuming to do this? And sh should they assume that, or can they assume that? Or what's the issue with it? So and we're going to talk about that. But, but yeah, here's a path analysis. Ironically, should not be just a path analysis. Uh, here are all the matrices. I didn't actually sl show these slides before, but these go with um, Kaplan's book, if you want to see it. Blah, blah, blah. What we're getting to is this. You build a model, it implies a covariance matrix for all the data, right? And here's the variance covariance matrix of the data if you're including your exogenous variables in the likelihood, which Levon does by default. So this is taking all anything that's endogenous and exogenous, stacking them in the data and saying the data should, if the model fits, this is what the data's covariance matrix should look like. And we mentioned this before, but it's a function of the regression weights in the path analysis and then some of the other terms, right? The regression of, this is, I believe, uh, y on other endogenous variables, y on y, this is y on x, and this is the covariance matrix between all the exogenous variables. So basically what you're getting at is, this complicated series of equations, once you break the math down, is describing the intricate multivariate relationship between all these variables. Right. Isn't this crystal clear? It's a joke. CFA, remember that? Oh, that was good times. We had drawings, there were circles, there was the all-seeing eyeball. Put a little eye right here. Right there. It's watching you. What is the name of that eye on the doll? Does anyone know? Eye of Providence, isn't it? I want to say that's it. Yes? Did I get a confirmation? You think. Because I'm, again, wanting to just play around and make this as jovial as possible. I throw matrices up there, but... Okay, Google. Define Eye of Providence. <laughs> Boom. Thank you, Google. <laughs> I got lucky. See, I've taught this. I've taught this before, <laughs> and you can go and relive those on the MP3s or on the, the videos online too. And you can see the bad jokes for that class, and and which student I pick on the most anyway. Isn't that right, Megan? All right. So in the factor model, it's like the path analysis, but it has a very it has a little bit easier structure. All if you're Measurement model, you have all the observed variables are essentially endogenous, and so we only have to f worry about that, and that's what this tells us. It's the covariance matrix of all of our endog endogenous variables altogether. But really what we want to do is do our path analysis with latent variables. So I want to demonstrate this with a, a small little example here using some of those, that good old-fashioned gambling data straight from this campus many years ago. All right? I think about like when I collected them and how old I was and, I, and how old the students were, and I realized that it's been so long now, we're all really old. <laughs> so those were like undergrads at the time. There may be some pathological gamblers in that group now. And maybe I helped them get to that point. You feel proud of yourself? Not really, no. Um, if I'm going to help enable something, it won't be gambling. <laughs> it'll, be, it'll be drinking, right? <laughs> statistics, hardcore statistics. <laughs> <Nice>. <laughs> Matrix algebra in statistics. But, um, 
here is a very small example. I'm going to take a gambling, take a, we're going to create a gambling factor. I'm going to create it with three observed variables from this scale. GRI1, GRI3, and GRI5. Now you may think to yourself, why on earth would I do that? Those three items are BS, and they are BS, and I'm just picking three of them. But I'm doing so because what happens if I were to ignore this part of the model, right here, if I took student out of it, what? Could you tell me what the model fit for that side would be? Perfect. That would be perfect fit. So I'm doing this in order to game the system to show you what happens when I even develop factors that are perfect because it's also going to blow up. Right? Now, in the big picture, this is a terrible idea for a study. The just identified variable of gambling here cannot be valid for gambling. It's the label I'm choosing for. It only represents three items. I don't know any construct that is as broad as gambling that really can be represented by three items. Maybe it's living. Are you breathing? Is your heart beating? <laughs> what is your body temperature? Right? Those are three items I can give you to assess whether or not you're living. The living scale. Right? Does that sound good? I don't know of another one. Can you, do you know of another scale that you can measure with three things? And have it be valid and reliable. Yeah, I don't know. And yeah, maybe not. <laughs> Good instructor. How many times did he go to Google? <laughs> <laughs> I read a, an article recently that described it as so and so went and got a degree at Google University, and I thought that was a very good, like, metaphor for uh, it was uh, someone critiquing somebody's science that's not really on one of the blog websites. That's it, the food babe, thank you. So you know what I'm talking about, Jezebel as a, for whatever reason, I, I'm hooked on, I love the Jezebel blog, even though I'm a man, I do. I, I'm proudly a man and proudly, you know, I, I, I'm into women, I just enjoy reading women, women talk about women's issues sometimes, it's cool. It just diversifies the portfolio a little bit, you know? So. <laughs> Um, but yeah, the food babe blog, I thought that was the most excellent takedown of like pseudoscience. I had to show it to Lisa. I was like, you've got to read this long post about why and where and how that this other website is wrong. And of course it invoked Dr. Oz and he, he just, I don't know what about Dr. Oz, but he scares me. So I don't know if you don't know Dr. Oz, that's good. Anyway, this is a perfect model, but it's not something we would do in practice. You'll see a lot of people do it in practice. But it's not something we should do because the, the construct gambling really doesn't mean anything here. It's just their uh, gambling. So I'm going to put that, maybe I should put it in quotes, gambling. All right. So what I'm going to do, though, is I'm going to take, this is the measurement model portion, and then the path model portion is this part. Actually, I guess it includes gambling. It's essentially saying I'm going to go and predict a person's proclivity, proclivity on gambling by their status of whether or not they were a student or not. This data set contains some 140 non-students and some 1,100 students or something along those lines. I can't remember the exact numbers. So I'd like to see, uh, I've coded this as a one if a person's a student and a zero otherwise. And in that, this would be, if I, if I, had, if I could actually observe a box that is called gambling, this would be a two-way, or a one-way ANOVA, right? Two groups. And this, this little slope, this thing right here, the beta represented by that slope, the beta weight, would be a mean difference between the two groups. Right? So that's, that's observable variable land, but I'm going to do so with our categorical or our continuous factor here, gambling. Right? So you can see how they both get put together. Questions? Is that weird? Now, big note. To do this in practice, uh, we're actually making a number of assumptions that may or may not hold. One of which is that we're measuring gambling the same, gambling that we're measuring is the same thing in students that we're measuring in adults or non-students. Right? Measurement invariance is what we call that in CFA. That will be the topic two lectures from now, it'll be three weeks from now. That doesn't stop people from doing this in practice as well. But uh, we shouldn't really do that. We should test the assumption first and then go from there. And actually, you'll see this, this assumption throws a wrench into our plans a little bit later on. So there's something funky with it. My own personal thought is that gambling that we're measuring isn't going to be the same with students and, and non-students. Students here, these were students who were 
undergraduates in the psychology subject pool from this great university. I think, Jake, you said you were a part of the subject pool here many years, or not many years ago, like maybe two weeks ago for all I know. <laughs> Sorry, Jake. Jake is a new first-year student and just out of undergrad, so I can I tend to joke about age, although you may be significantly older than that. Um, I feel like I'm insulting you now. I'm picking on Jake. Um, I'm digging a hole. Stop digging. Um, I don't think it's going to be true. Anyway, do this. So the first step is the measurement model. Here's the syntax for the measurement model. You've seen this before. And I was told this was going to fit perfectly, and darn it, it does. Do you see that? We have an equivalent model to a saturated model. Right? So really that means the gambling factor, maybe not so much a factor. It's the same thing as saying, yeah, there's a gambling factor or all three variables we need all at once. Right? There's no testable hypothesis there, but it fits perfectly, so I'm going to move a foot, move head. Remember, don't ever do this. It's very bad. You'll see people do it all the time. Stay away from them. Anyway. Um, here are the results. Everything looks pretty cool. All the variables are significant. All the loadings are significant. And uh, we have an R square that seems OK for each of the items. Everything look, look like a factor analysis to you? You're bored by it now. Oh, that's so easy. Here's a path diagram. Wow, I even put a path diagram on there. Or I would say not a model. I believe Billy would say, where's the algebra? I need the algebra behind this. And I agree. I'm all about it, or at least R is, and I haven't figured out how to change change the color. <laughs> the eagles? Yep. Or is there a, 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 an adjective to eagles? Just the eagles. Yeah, the eagles? Not the like the the screaming eagles or the wicked eagles or yep, no, just like eagles. That. I like it. Good. That means you probably came. You were one of the first eagles to be built, rather than like you know newer terms. If, you have to, if you're like a brand new college, you come up with a football team, you've got to come up with a brand new adjective in front of eagles, right? Wretched eagles or something. Anyway. So here's our measurement model uh, implied covariance matrix. You'll note that that is the same as our saturated model covariance matrix and our measurement model implied mean vector. So now we can take that result and add to it the student variable. And sure enough, you're going to get tired of me saying this, but we define the gambling factor in this syntax line that I just highlighted right there. And in the next line, we're treating it just like it was a variable that we had observed. All right? In fact, if this top line wasn't there, you'd say, oh, that's just a simple regression of student predicting gambling. But because it's, it's a factor, things are a little bit more complicated. But there, there's the two pieces of syntax that will do that model that I had just built for you before. Student now is treated as an in the, in the exogenous variable. We can call it an independent variable. And gambling, which in the previous model was exogenous, is now predicted. So it's endogenous, meaning it should now, its, it's residual variance or its variance of gambling should now shrink a little bit at least because we're predicting it. it should, if, it's, if it's no effect, it should shrink marginally right, or zero. And if there's a strong effect, we should see that variance shrink because we're explaining variation. Uh, gam var ga variation in gambling is due to people being students or people not. Variation in st student status. So uh, just like we would in the path analysis, we'd have to go and count parameters. We can count them. We have four observed variables. Here's where things get a little interesting. And we were pretty cool with counting in factor in path analysis when we could observe everything. And then in factor analysis, we said, oh, the factor is an exogenous variable, but then we didn't count it in anything. And that's how it works here, too. We count just the number of observed variables in our analysis. There are four. That means that we have a total of 10 variances and covariances in the covariance matrix. It's four by four. And then the uh, number of means we have are, we have four means altogether for these. So the number of parameters in our analysis, if we go back a slide or we go back a couple, I guess I don't, we have several things. We have two factor loadings. We're, gonna, we're, we're using the marker item technique here. By the way, in a few slides, I'm going to not do the marker item just to show you the difference. I remember that was a question. 
And for those of you REM students in our program where we never see anything but standardized factor elsewhere, I'm going to show you why, what changes in that. Right. It's the same fit. You'll just see, see some stuff go a little haywire. That's all. Um, anyway, six of one, half dozen of the other. We have two factor loadings. That means for the two items, uh, GRI3, GRI5, we have one factor variant still. I guess it's now a residual variance because it's being predicted. We have three unique variances, one for each of the GRI items that are indicating that gambling factor. We have one direct effect, that is the term for the regression slope or the beta weight from student predicting the, f the gambling factor. We have three item intercepts right here. And we have one exogenous variance. The three item intercepts, by the way, are the intercepts for each of the GRI items. And then we have one exogenous variance, which is the variance of our gambling variable itself, which it shouldn't be there, but it's a, sorry, var sorry, exogenous variance, pardon me, it's not variance of gambling, it's a variance of student. And this is where Levon putting everything in the likelihood starts to get on my nerves, because you can't assume student is a normally distributed variable, but it's going to anyway. So we do that. And here is our assessment of model fit. Uh, let's take a look at the likelihood ratio test. That likelihood ratio test is not significant. You're like, yeah, but tell me something I didn't know. This is SEM, right? Some of you are telling me that. Maybe not. So you're like, show me the RMSEA. RMSEA of 0.17. That's pretty bad. Believe it or not, I have seen an RMSEA of 0.17 published in a technical manual once of a test that people buy and use. Crazy. Um, a standardized root mean squared residual uh, is 0.05. The CFI and TLI, there is a bad one. TLI is 0.393. CFI is 0.798. Jennifer, does this fit? No, Jennifer does not say it fits. It's a bad idea, right? So I would actually say this is a, knowing these data pretty well, this is an, an indicator that that assumption I just told you that gambling is measuring the same thing between students and non-students may be called into question. But that, um, we'll get to that. Let's take a look at where the misfit happens. So now, if this is you, up to this point in this class, what have we done? What's our next step? This is a global model fit. Local model fit. Thank you. What's that? OK. Local or loco model fit, one of the two. All right, normalized residuals up over here. Do you see one that looks, ab looks abnormal? Some might say 4.6 is a bit high. 4.6 is a bit high, right? That thing's supposed to be under 2, and you look at all the other ones. What is it? The it's the residual covariance between the student status and the third GRI item. That's crazy, right? It says that there's something a bit amiss on that item. Don't quite know what that is. Let's take a look at our modification indices. Our modification indices, ironically, don't have the combination of student with any of the items. They only have the combinations of residual variances or covariances, which are right here. They have the omitted factor loadings at the top. And then they have all the omitted pathways, which aren't any. So it's telling us right here, oh, we, we really need residual covariances. But I know a thing better. I looked at this normalized residual covariance. Measure. This is an exercise of learning Levon. This is where Levon's limitation is. Levon should be giving us some of these residual covariances between the items, the actual things we've observed. Instead of, it's, it's kind of filtering it through the factor itself, and that, it's not copacetic for me. So how do you make a huge normalized residual covariance get better? If this were any of the weeks ahead of this. How about them royals? You can put a covariance in the model. 
although this model becomes unidentified when we add a covariance with student GRI3. Isn't that terrible? Actually, it may not be. There's a way, but add things to the model, right? So we could say, let's go back to this real quick. I don't actually think it's unidentified to do this. Do this right here, right? No, it is unidentified. We end up getting a cycle, right? If you go this way and then this way, you can get back to here, which is bad. That's That won't work. But a covariance is one way. What's another way that we can make it better? Direct effect, which would look like this. Ignore that it went. It's kind of like going around. There we go, like that. Not, not going through gambling. Have you seen a model like this before? Isn't that weird? Like students interfering with the measurement of gambling. Yeah, it kind of is. kind of needs to be is what it's telling us. Yeah, that's what we're going to do. We're going to add a direct effect there because that re normalized residual is blowing up. So let's talk a little bit. There it is right there. The biggest source of misfit comes from the covariance right here between student and GRA3. And we can't, in our model, put an indirect effect between those. But we can say, OK, student is going to predict GRA3. Technically, GRA3 could predict student, or could it? That might also give us a cycle. I think there's only one that we can put in that will work. So the syntax for adding it is, is what you've seen before. GRI3 shows up first and says it's predicted by student, but it also measures gambling. Right? So it's just another line of syntax, another part of the path model. You're cool with that, right? I've seen your homework threes. You look cool with it, or am I just an easy grader? Depends on the homework. Uh, depends on the part of the semester. When, when stuff gets real, right? <laughs> if things get complicated, everybody gets an A. Everybody's going to get an A anyway, mostly. So. Um, speaking of, let me break this. In my email to you about your um, project two, I mentioned your grade on in Black Blackboard. Again, that's that's your grade as if you stopped today where it would be, right? So that means you may see a grade that's not really reflective of how many points you've gotten out of the total so far. That's the total total factored in. So don't freak out. That's just that means if you want to quit, you can see where your grade would be. All right? <laughs> don't quit either. I, I, I'm not done with you yet. I don't want you to quit, but you may want to make that choice. You may be tired of me. Um, so what is this doing, though? Let's take a look at this equation right here. This is the equation of our new model. Right? We have an item intercept. We have the gambling factor and its factor loading. And then we have the student variable predicting it with our student direct effect. Plus we have error. That is just your typical regression model like you would see everywhere else. Does that seem pretty understandable? Let's take a look at the item. If I lost a lot of money gambling one day, I would more likely want to play again the following day. It's telling us something. I don't know what it is. There's something about that item that causes differences. What is your interpretation? In a, in a model that looks like this, how would you interpret this direct effect. Does anyone have a soundboard? Play the crickets chirping sound? Let me, ask you, mm -hmm. let me ask you what you're asking. Yeah. Are you saying, what do we think about the question in relation to why that would make? Uh, I'm actually, not quite yet, no. because uh, we're going we're gonna to answer, we're going to talk about that once we get our estimate of it. I'm asking, what does this thing right here mean? Difference, difference between non-student and student. 
Difference between non-student and students, because student is a zero, one variable, right? So when student is zero, this thing, whole thing goes away, right? But when student equals one, let's just move this over. Now we have this constant here. It talks about the difference in the intercept, right? So now, Steve, I'm going to actually, now that we know this, this effect right here is representing kind of our modification to the intercept. It's a main effect of student on item three. This is exactly what we would call this in your linear regression context. Right? This is a nice univariate linear regression that we see here when we interpret our parameters. So knowing that this modifies the intercept, that's saying what? draw this in terms of linear regression. This is the score for a person on item three. And this is um, the gambling factor. Right, so this is the factor score, if we could observe it. What this is saying is there is one line that looks like this, and there is another line that looks like this. And the only difference in the line is the difference in the intercepts. So now, Steve, which, which line do you think is going to be up for the student versus that for the gamblers? Well, that one's a student. Well, it's not possible. But this could be a negative, right? Yeah. So if you were just ignoring beta for a second, if you were to say, now again, this is, this is, does not, this is like a 1. This is a six. This means uh, this is a negative endorsement. This is a positive endorsement of that statement. Who do you think is more likely to have the upper line versus the lower line? The non-students, the non -students, right? This is students equals zero. Students equals one. And we would see that if beta right here uh, was negative negative beta right here right? uh, because this would be your intercept and you have to shrink it for non-students right let's see what happens is everybody following the logic here I'm dwelling on this for a little bit right now because it's um, it's really part of the bigger picture right this is what we would talk about in a this is an ANCOVA model right here it just happens to be that this thing on the, I'm knocking to the class, sorry class, um, this x variable right here is a factor, but we're pretending like it's real for this context to describe it. So in a structural equation model, your interpretation of the effects are the same as if you would understand them in a linear regression context. Okay. What is a, what are we assuming, we always talk about this in ANCOVA, what did we assume to, in an ANCOVA model? These are parallel, right? Uh, if these were not parallel, it'd actually be an interaction between student and gambler. Right? That's what we're going to test for in when we get to non-invariance, the, the invariant measurement invariance. That would be saying that this item is functioning differently for students versus non-students. For those of you in my program, we talk about diff all the time. That's diff. If this is uniform diff, that's a non-uniform diff. It gets all sorts of stuff. But we can't actually do that in this model right now because of our software. We have to do, the software keeps us from catching it. So we're actually still making assumptions. We're actually assuming that gambling is the same for students versus not. The only difference is that the mean of the item is different between students and non-students. This model, uh, this setup, as a, is a very old-fashioned model. It's from, uh, I believe it's from Carl Joriskog in the 1970s. It's called a multiple indicators, multiple causes, or mimic model. And if you, are, if you are in the world of things, it's a very simple way to make a model fit better. You still have things that you may have to test for. It still may not be right, but it's a step closer. It'll give, probably give us good model fit with just one parameter really quick. If you're a REMS student or if you're another student who heard the words diff or invariance testing, this is a very simple way of doing invariance testing. It's very old-fashioned. 
it's a step in the right direction. We really need to do what we're going to talk about in a couple weeks where we actually add in the interaction term. Ironically, when we add that interaction term in, we're not even going to, the, the books and the way the software works doesn't look like an interaction, but it really is. So. Have you heard of Mimic before? No? It's in the CFA book. That's good. Yeah, I, um, true story, I had a, a student in a different department on campus that I was part of his dissertation committee recently, and he was doing something to test that interaction and mimic. And was like, well, there, was a, uh, there was a part of the dissertation where it was a quant dissertation, so I was kind of like, I bur blurred the words out, well, nobody cares about mimic anymore. And really what I should say is nobody should care about it, right? This is just another, another step in the right direction. Just because, you, just because you has a name to it that people knew, mean doesn't mean it's the be-all and end-all. It just means we're adding ANCOVA-like. We're now testing for intercept differences between groups, but that's it. Okay, here it comes, the results. First of all, model fit. Look at that. Remember when I talk about likelihood ratio tests? That makes me happy. I got goosebumps again. Likelihood ratio test gives me goosebumps because it never, ever fits. All right, well, with one degree of freedom, this thing fit. Last week with 207 degrees of freedom, it fit. That was pretty amazing. So uh, that means pretty much everything else will fit too. Look at this, the RMSCA, the CFI, the TLI, the standardized root mean squared residual. All of the local fit looks good. Jennifer, this fits. Jennifer is pleased. So let's take a look at the intercept, and then I'm going to go to break after this intercept. Where is the intercept right here? Intercept. Intercept for student is dun, 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 positive, not negative. And on that, we're going to take a break. Learn more at 11. We'll be right back.